Yeah, hello. Now, finally, good evening, everyone. My name is Andreas Bieler. I'm one of the three co-directors of the Independent Center for the Study of Social and Global Justice. And it's my particular pleasure to chair this evening's CSSGJ seminar and to welcome Dr. Victoria Araj from Lincoln University. Now, Victoria holds a PhD in Peace Studies from the University of Bradford, and she currently works in the Public History Project. Where do I find the title? Reimagining Lincolnshire. That's it. And actually, that project in itself sounds pretty fascinating, yeah, because it uh, seeks to uncover hidden and neglected stories from Lincolnshire, linking that to both the empire and slavery. And in itself, actually, yeah, that could be an excellent topic for a presentation to CSSGJ. However, tonight's topic is actually even more pressing. We all have heard about the genocide perpetrated by Israel against the Palestinians in Gaza and equally outside Gaza. We've heard about that. Now, Victoria is going to speak about a particular aspect, educide. Yeah, and I think coming from a more educational background, this is actually uh, of highest importance also for us here. Now, we are going to proceed in the usual manner. Victoria, you will have about 35 to 40 minutes for your presentation. And this will then leave us with another similarly long time of up to 40 minutes for questions, answers, and discussion. So without further ado, Victoria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Andreas. And I really want to say what a privilege it is to have you um, with me this evening and um, to have this platform. Um, I want to begin by offering um, my solidarity and congratulations to Professor David Miller, who has just won a historical case on this subject. And yay, for the first time in history, um, the anti-Zionist ideology and belief will be a protected characteristic. So that certainly makes my job more secure. Um, and it's some good news in some very dark times. So um, I want to sort of go a bit further into the crimes uh, around what's going on with the Palestinian education system. And please bear with me because this is just a sort of kind of concept paper more than anything. And my idea is to really frame the edgicide in in um what it in Palestine and in Gaza is something that is is systemic, historical, and it's something that is beyond borders. Um, and it targets Palestinian knowledge production just as much as it targets uh, the education rights. Um, so we know that on the 26th of January, the International Court of Justice, um, South Africa versus Israel, um, had their ruling on the crime of genocide in the Gaza Strip. And in this, Blinne uh, Negrale QC noted that almost 90,000 Palestinian university students are unable to currently attend university in Gaza. Over 60% of schools and 
almost all universities, and I believe now that is all universities, and countless bookshops and libraries have been damaged, destroyed, and hundreds of teachers and academics have been killed, including deans of universities and leading Palestinian scholars. And it was noted on the record that this obliterates the very prospects for the future education of Gaza's children and young people. According to Euromed Monitor, this has been deliberate and the Israeli army has targeted academic, scientific and intellectual figures in the Gaza Strip in deliberate targeted air raids on their homes. And this policy has killed at least 94 academics. Tragically, those targeted have been crushed to death beneath the rubble, along with members of their families and other displaced families. And there has been no clear reason or justification behind the targeting of these people by the Israeli um, occupation forces. Within this group, it includes 17 individuals who were professors, 59 with PhDs, 18 master's degrees, and there are additional numbers of targeted academics, including those with advanced degrees whose deaths have not been tallied. Now, if you think about that cumulative, cumulative knowledge of those people, you understand the, the, the huge loss of knowledge that, that this represents. And the targeted academics studied and ta taught across a variety of ac academic disciplines. And many of their ideas served as not only the cornerstone of academic research in the Gaza Strip, but also in, in um, the Middle East. And, and in some, some cases, these are leading world experts in their field. We also know that more than 40%, that's around 300 of schools in Gaza, are, are run by the United Nations Relief and Works Agency. And UNRWA are um, a refugee agency that was set up before you even had the United Nations um, Commission of, of, of refugees and it was a specific specifically set up to deal with the situation of Palestinian refugees um, during and after the, the Nakba and to facilitate the right of return of Palestinian refugees to their ancestral homeland. When you understand that history and you understand the importance of these schools and of what UNRWA represents, you might begin to understand why the United States, Britain and other countries declared their defunding of UNRWA um, on January 27th after the ICJ ruling and this very much violates their responsibilities in the Geneva Convention. And it also impacts not only the schools and the UNRWA schools in Gaza, which are now obviously closed, and some of what are left are shelters, but those which are shelters are also being targeted and destroyed by um, the Isra by Israeli genocidal acts. Um, but these these schools also operate in the West Bank. They operate in also in refugee camps in places such such as Lebanon. Um, 
So this de defunding actually represents a, cr a crime and a denial of the education rights of Palestinians and Palestinian, specifically Palestinian children, who I think we would all agree have suffered enough. In the past couple of days, Naledi Pandor, who is the South African foreign minister, has stated that the ICJ ruling clearly shows that it is plausible that genocide is being committed against the Palestinian people in Gaza. And this necessarily imposes an obligation on all states to stop financing and facilitating Israel's military actions. And that is a message directed at Mr. Biden, Mr. Blinken, Mr. Sunak, I think um, also uh, Starmer, but also to um, the, the VCs and uh, the vice chancellors of, of Britain's universities. Her comments about the role of third parties further negates the legality of the efforts to defund UNRWA. And particularly, I believe, if you look at this through a framework of edicide. So I, um, I think that really the crimes against Gaza's education system, children's rights, etc., need to be contextualized in the historic and material oppression of the education rights of the Palestinian people. So what is edicide and how does it differ from genocide? Well, edicide was first used by scholars to describe the wholesale destruction of the education system of Iraq in the 2003 illegal war. And I believe it is also applicable to the Palestinian case. Since the 2003 illegal war in Iraq, it was then proposed by scholars of international law such as Rula Alusi, that edicide should be picked up as a crime by the ICJ and the ICC. And this fueled a debate amongst scholars around the genocide of systems, such as the healthcare system, and was inclusive of the education system. And edicide begins to represent the wholesale destruction of an education system through which you destroy the past, the present, and indeed the future. And I do keep wondering this, and I think if we had learned the lessons a bit more and about Iraq and had more accountability for the crimes against Iraq, there would maybe not be so much complicity from the British higher education system about the edicide of Palestine. On the current crime of edicide, in the rest of Palestine, outside of the Gaza Strip, it is evident that the education system is a target of Israel's genocide. With Britain, the US and other Western countries complicit in the erasure of Palestinian culture, learning, knowledge production and education rights and this the, this becomes evident of 
a, of a system and become systematic, when we look at the situation in historical Palestine, the West Bank, and the areas occupied by Israel in 1948, such as Nazareth, Haifa, etc., the refugee camps, particularly Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, but also the wider Palestinian diaspora across the world. And the systematic nature of this edgicide emerges when the framework includes our situation and the situation of Palestinian scholars and students in places such as the UK, Germany and the US, and the situation of Palestine studies and the erasure of Palestine from institutional decolonial scholarship. This edgicide and indeed erasure of Palestinian knowledge and knowledge production also includes libraries, cultural production, museums, both inside and outside of Palestine, and also includes the theft of Palestinian historical objects, which we regularly see, from example, um, collaborations with the Israeli Archaeological um, Association. What's more, it includes the erasure of a Palestinian future through the denial of digital rights, digital space, and the desire, denial of Palestinians in the use of technology for educational purposes, such as digital archiving, the use of um, dig, uh, the use of the internet in an in an equal way, and um, the the access that Palestinians have, which is being completely denied to the people of Gaza. There is no internet, essentially, in Gaza. However, what we need to understand is that this edicide is not an isolated genocidal act, but it is also a systematic continuation of racialized capitalism and imperialism and the destruction of the ways of knowing, sites of resistance and knowledge and cultural production of colonized people. And this is to ensure that only an orientalized Palestine or a highly neoliberal westernized Palestine exists um, so I want to sort of elaborate a bit more on the current situation of edicide by territory. And I will start with um, the West Bank. And the SUD uh, Trade Union have noted that since 1988, Birzeit University, which is one of the most prominent universities um, near Ramallah in the West Bank, launched a right to education campaign, which it asked people all over the world to join. And this was at a time when Palestinian universities had been closed down in the uh, Antifada by occupying Israeli military authorities. And it was a, a horrific time um, where teachers and students who transported textbooks or organized clandestine courses were prosecuted. And I, I know about these clandestine courses because I'm proud that I have a heritage of these spaces in in my family um through the educators in my family and 
since then, the colleagues in Birzeit have been documenting Israel's systematic attacks on higher education in the West Bank and Gaza. And these include students and members of staff being prevented from accessing their places of study by military checkpoints. Of course, the illegal wall proves an extreme barrier to education access in the West Bank. Um, just a note for those of you who, who might not know that the ICJ also um, deemed the wall illegal in, in 2004, another sort of ICJ ruling that was completely um, ignored by Israel. And one of the reasons that cite, well, was cited was indeed the impact on education. Um, you have continuous military raids on campuses and students and staff regularly detained and humiliated by the occupation forces. As recently as the 24th of September 2023, the University of Bizet and I would like to say that this is before October 7th, um, was attacked by Israeli military forces who assaulted personnel and detained eight students. And before October 7th, this is just a regular occurrence in West Bank universities. Since then, and before then, in, in the rest of the West Bank, in-person teaching has been severely disrupted at 34 higher education uh, institutions by an increase in the number of checkpoints, raids and attacks conducted by the occupying Israeli military forces. And this has affected 130 138,800 students who now learn online. Um, and actually, since the 7th of October in the West Bank, Israeli military authorities have arrested several dozen students in raids, and they have suffered from intrusive body searches and ill treatments. And we know that tens of students and staff members from universities are currently being held in Israeli jails as hostage in administrative detention. Administ for those who, who don't know, again, administrative Detention is is uh, detention without trial that is continually renewed by the Israeli occupation forces. Inside Israel, or, or what we uh, Palestinians it, it call 48, Palestinian students face threats and dismissal from universities. And almost 200 Palestinian students have been disciplined for comments or publications critical of Israel's attack on Gaza. Also for taking part in peace demonstrations, and this is usually followed by expulsion. Um, Palestinian students in Israel also face violence on campus. And on October the 28th, Israeli police in Netanya had to intervene to stop several hundred far-right militants who were trying to force their way into a university residence housing Palestinian students while chanting death to the Arabs. Palestinians in Israel have no university of their own. Their education rights are systematically 
denied by the Israeli state, who deny permits for universities and schools inside Palestinian majority cities and villages. The schools that do exist are heavily policed by the Israeli authorities and Palestinians are both denied their right to learn and also denied to, the, the ex, the, the, to exercise their cultural identity. Um, I think it's also important to note that Israeli education unions do not advocate for the equal rights of Palestinian students, teachers, or lecturers. I would now also like to talk about the situation of edgicide beyond historic Palestine. And this is where I think it's important to understand edgicide as a system of erasure. And um, education access for Palestinians in refugee camps in Syria, Lebanon and Jordan face continuous significant challenges and this reflects the protracted nature of their displacement as the longest refugee population on the planet. In Syria, we've seen that the situation which happened um, in uh, after the Arab Spring meant that, for example, those in Yarmouk camp were again denied their education rights for, for a second time. And these sort of continued displacements within protracted conflicts in, in the Middle East make it difficult for Palestinian refugees to access a consistent and quality education, which they, they, they could if they were allowed to just come home. Of course, we know the terrible situation of Lebanon's strained resources and how the West and particularly Europe have just um, left Lebanon to, to uh, basically be uh, the, the catch basket for, for their for their wars and their war crimes and the situation in Lebanon means that there is limited infrastructure completely strained resources and Palestinian children continually experience barriers to enrollment and we also know that Palestine because of the situation of the refugees in, in Lebanon, they also face continued barriers to empl employment. So they are to 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 live, as you were, as uh, as, as as citizens and edu and educated citizens in 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 that way. They're denied and marginalised from the norms of, of of the of the Lebanese state. In Jordan, while efforts have been made to integrate uh, Palestinian refugees into the national education system, socio-economic disparities still persist. And despite all of these challenges across the Middle East, UNRWA have been working tirelessly to provide some educational opportunities and to bridge the gaps and empower Palestinian youth to overcome this adversity. And, in, and, and actually, a lot of the time, that is through our history of resilience. And that is through the Palestinian way of knowing. And that is something 
that at least um, some of UNRWA respect. And the defunding thus of UNRWA by Britain, the US and other states completely put the continuity of these efforts at risk and condemns those beyond Gaza um, to, 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 a, to a life of despair. And what of beyond the Middle East? What of edgicide beyond the, the Middle East? The situation of Palestine studies and the, <clears throat> excuse me, and the, the knowledge production on Palestine is continually at threat in the Western world. Um, and I do see this as another sign, another arm of the edge side against the Palestinian people. In the United States, instances have been reported where academics who have been vocal in their support for Palestinian rights or critical of Israeli policies inside their scholarship and outside of their scholarship have faced the uh, death threats, doxing, the termination of their employment and of their tenure. In the US, funding for research projects that explore Palestinian perspectives are always limited and always under extreme scrutiny, which really harms the depth of academic inquiry. Here in the UK, we know that university events, even peace vigils, in which at my institution we've had two, um, and had massive uh, complaints from the University um, of Lincoln, um, these events discussing or acknowledging Palestinian pain or the Palestinian experience have faced cancellations and disruptions. Um, and a lot of this has been under the sort of guise of the IHRA definition on anti-Semitism. And the IHRA uh, definition is continuing to pose a threat to scholarship on Palestine with criticism of Israel being labelled as anti-Semitism. And this has led to a culture of fear in academic institutions that silences work on Palestine. We also know um, that David has challenged it and, and won this in the court. So we will see where this goes, but there is a tiny bit of hope which, which continues to drive us in our fight against this oppression. The situation also we know in Germany is absolutely horrific for scholarship on, on, on Palestine. Um, and there is a continuous threat to funds. Sometimes Palestinian funding is contingent on, on not, um, funding for Palestinian issues is contingent on not, um, on, 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 on not criticizing Israel. Um, and what is more, scholars from Palestinian universities who try to engage in partnerships with European colleagues are forced to sign a racist anti-terrorism declaration. Of course, this arm of the edgicide against Palestinian knowledge is also widespread in schools in the West. We know here in the UK that more than 100 children have been targeted with repression and censorship for expressing pro-Palestinian sentiments, with some referring to the government's counter, being referred to the 
government's counterterrorism program prevent. We have also seen the deliberate and appropriate uh, the deliberate destruction of Palestinian archives and libraries, which is something that happened a lot as well during the Nakba. And I would like to um, say that Librarians with Palestine, which is a brilliant website, have compiled a report on Gaza about the destruction of libraries and other cultural heritage institutions in the Gaza Strip. And this includes um, at least 10 libraries, the killing of archivists and librarians, and the destruction of museums. Um, and I really um, encourage those on this uh, call to um, go and, and and have a look at their, their website because it is really horrifying. And we know that this erasure of Palestinian knowledge is is something that is rooted not only in in um, the Israeli occupation and uh, it's rooted in the Nakba of 1948 and it's also rooted in um, the policies of the British mandate and I would just like to end by reminding everybody of the words of Nalade Pandor, who has said there is an obligation on all states to stop financing and facilitating Israel's military action and to stop, and this means to stop fun financing and facilitating Israel's edgicide. And universities and British institutions invest millions of pounds in companies that um, are implicated in Israel's military occupation, colonialism and apartheid. And I hope that we can maybe discuss about what we can do to end this, end this complicity and put an end to this Palestinian erasure and this Palestinian edgicide. Thank you. Yes, thanks a lot, Victoria, for this powerful presentation. These are dark times indeed, and yet it is important yeah, to, to bring out those topics as you have done on Edusite in, in Palestine and to discuss also what we can do in order to go against <laughs> the destruction of knowledge production. So we now have a good 35 to 40 minutes for discussions and debate. I've already got one uh, colleague with uh, his hand up. So if you want to speak, please electronically signal that. And in general, those of you with cameras, if you want to switch on your camera, that's very welcome. So we get a bit of a seminar atmosphere, but of course, no pressure. This is all voluntarily. So please think about questions. And I hand over to John for the first questions. Over to you, John. Thank you, Andreas, and thank you, Victoria, for a very stimulating uh, presentation. Um, I'm a librarian, so um, I'm very aware of uh, the activities that are going on uh, to protect the library heritage and collections uh, in, uh, in Palestine. Uh, but my question for you is, what is the relationship between educide and cultural genocide? Because you're, you're probably aware that cultural genocide nearly became part of the uh, genocide convention, but it was it was it didn't make it into the final draft. And you're also probably aware that cultural genocide almost made it into the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So cultural genocide refers to the eradication and destruction of cultural artifacts such as books. Uh, museums, libraries, uh, etc. So I, I'm seeing a connection between the two. But could you just um, explain the explain the relationship, please? 
Um, to you, Victoria. Oh, okay. So really, um, the the relationship between edgicide, which is the genocide of the education system, and the genocide of um, cult, a, a cultural, the cultural genocide, are completely um, interlinked and, and intertwined because we know and we know that actually without these cultural institutions and without the actual objects of knowledge and without if if, if you will that the knowledge capital and the cultural cultural production you have no education and i think what sort of happened happened in in um in in palestine is is you have on the one hand you have a, a the cultural genocide which is around the erasure of palestinian heritage and palestinian artifacts palestinian the palestinian archive if you will and this sort of begins to take place as the world zionists um start to look at uh, at palestine and as and start to challenge the palestinian um existence as a people and as as an as an entity and and they do this by um first of all the narrative in in papers by creating a scholarship about how um there is no there is no palestine there's no palestinian history and at the same at the same time what you what what happens is they start to um attack tangible heritage so they start to um, attack libraries. They start to steal books. They start to steal steal artifacts, anything that um, would deem uh, the Palest Palestinians as as a people. Now, the way that I see this relating to the edgicide component of Palestine is that it's 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 almost like it's all my, and, and and I think what you can see is is actually this is where the colonial British roots come in, right? So during the mandate, during the British mandate, um, you have an education policy of Palestine, which is to almost modernize the modernize the Arabs like like you you have everywhere in the world like oh let's civilize let's civilize these barbaric people and th and these were the tenets of of the um of the edgicide so and these were the foundations of that because it was through that and th that 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 the whole concept of the education system is based around the erasure of Palis Palestinianness and being Palestinian. So at first, so 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 they become entangled, and but what's happening now is the Israeli state. Um, previously, the 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 a lot of the the education system in palestine has been held up by neoliberal ideas and funding injections and it's it's been almost de-developed in that way so you can look at sarah roy's work on de-develop where she examines how palestine's not allowed to have any socio-economic de development you, there's no possible way to do it within um, the current framework of, of occupation but Palestinians can have a basic level of education which me which sort of appeases us and keeps us which keeps us going but at the same time there's these attacks on our 
constant attacks on our cultural heritage and our nationhood and our way of of knowing and our indigenous knowledge and so what you see now in gaza is that has moved from um actually just that sort of cultural erasure of palestinian knowledge and palestinian knowledge production and the decoloniality decoloniality around that to the to not even having that to not even having that level of basic neoliberal education which means that you can get by um and maybe um get by enough to to not resist the occupation so now you have the the complete sort of the, the i would say britain uh, israel the america they've been very clear that no you played up this is your punishment your punishment is you don't eat you not only have you had your cultural cultural erase but now you will face the comp complete erasure of your people the complete erasure of any education rights and and it's and and when we uh, and we see this accelerated after the icj ruling because and this is something that you see historically throughout um, the colonial past where when populations have then stood up to the colonizer through educated means and through i guess their tools they're like no we're not having this and then start to um to to punish and collectively punish the population um so yeah that that is Thank where you very I much. see them so quite complicated <laughs> But I, 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 that's how I sort of see the story of, of, of it's, it's a sort of connectedness between erasure and um, it's, 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 I guess it's, it's the past. It's like you can't have your past, you can't have your present, and you certainly cannot have have your future. Thank you. You explained it very well. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Victoria. I've got one question from the chat and then I hand over to my colleague Lopa. So first of all, from the chat uh, by Rosa Davis. Hello, I work for Community Art Gallery and we have been talking a lot about how we can respond to what we've all read in the news these past few months. Do you have any advice or insights for us as a gallery? Similarly, have you seen any art projects or creative community projects that have effectively shed light on the issues you've raised tonight. Over to you, Victoria. Yeah. So um, I would. I the, the first thing really when it comes to to this issue, and when it comes to um, cultural institutions such as um, community art galleries, is that I would highly recommend, of course, that you do not take on the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism in, in terms of your EDI policies. I also recommend that you sign up to the academic and to the cultural boycott of um, uh, Israeli cultural institutions. And this um, is because of the way that the Israeli cultural institutions are involved in both apartheid and now in in in, uh, in genocide, so I think it's really important to 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 um, be aware of of those boycotts and be aware of where your sort of partnerships go, your um your money goes. For uh, an example, is this Sunday actually. Um, one of the theatres in London was supposed to have an Israeli funding event with for the Technion um, University, which is the the Israeli Occupation Forces um, University, where much of the uh, geno genocidal genocidal technology is is made. And what happened was workers refused to um workers refused to 
work at at the event so it was it was uh it was cancelled and the the theatre refused to host it so it's it's sort of signing up and to those initiatives and saying no we will not host these kind of exhibitions these these um these kind of these kind kind of events um it you've also got to look very much where your your funding comes from and where you are you are look you need to look into you know um does this come come from from anyone involved in the arms trade um i noticed recently the international bomb command museum have are hosting a a breakfast with the greater lincolnshire defense partnership and it's and it's those sorts of things which cultural institutions can get together and actually condemn and say that we aren't we aren't signing up to this no genocide no complicity in our names um so i think also what i've seen is is um and what i've experienced in the past few months when it's come to decoloniality and this has been at the university it's been that um, decolonialism can only be something in the that deals with the past that doesn't deal with the future that it, it also completely marginalizes the palestinian voice and indigenous voices so i think it's also really important to when you're looking at decolonizing your collections to think about the present and to think about those who are being marginalized today and to not to not sort of go into this this narrative that that that's happening of like the trend of of decoloniality which is basically a, how do we we appropriate this um in a way that's comfortable for white fragility if it's comfortable then you don't it, you're doing it wrong <laughs> you need to be as uncomfortable with what you're doing as possible um with regards to um, links in Palestine, I would say we know that the heritage of Gaza has completely and utterly been destroyed, but you can try and collaborate with galleries, with artists in Palestine. You can maybe say that you want to host, even if it seems not plausible at the moment, you might want to host um, Gazan artists. There's also many works of artists who've been murdered in Gaza and lots of women artists as well. And their work's going to be lost forever. So in, in a way, if you, there's a way that you can display their work, that would be fantastic. I um, hope that's helpful. Thanks a lot. Victoria, for these very concrete suggestions of what we can also do. Lopa, over to you. You're muted, sorry. Tricky with the mobile phone to unmute. Okay, can Get you hear me now? Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, thank you for your talk and your answers. I just had one question because I was watching, I mean, uh, I come from a, the medical profession and I was watching the universities that have been uh, bombed and um, looking at the hospitals and the nurses and the doctors, the Palestinian ones, um, they will no longer be able to be trained, you know, the, the health professionals, the care workers and so on. So that's another way of, you know, how do we... Well, it's already done, I suppose. I don't know how many of them have been. So how do we somehow help in that? Because they will not have people to be able to work in their hospitals. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So the best way in which we can support um, those efforts is through, through scholarships, through pressing. For, so we do know that the government put on a, a scheme for Ukrainian refugees to continue their education. No such scheme 
has been declared for Palestinian refugees, and that is something which the um, which most refugee organisations in the UK have also lobbied the government on. So Refugee Council have a really good page on their website about it. But what what needs to happen is not only do we need to um, l lobby our government to stop this genocide, and um, we also we also need to lobby them to continue to uh, to stop to the defunding of UNRWA to continue UNRWA's um, work, but also that we want a um, scholarship scheme just like the Ukrainians had. But it's also upon medical the medical union like the um, so if you can advocate within your trade unions within the rcn within the british medical association that um you can support these people to come here that you want these people to come and to learn about how to how to how to train it in in, in the uk and continue their education um and also to lobby the, the the universities to do the same, and to and to even though the government is refusing to, and that's the big excuse of the universities, and they say they have no money and blah blah, it's all rubbish. And I th they can definitely lobby the the VCs can write to the government about it, and also the they can they can fund fund it. Even if they take a, a pay cut, they can fund one one a med student in, in from Palestine. So I think, yeah, I think it's really important yeah. to just keep pushing that we want to be a place where we can host refugees. That we want to be a place of refuge, and we want these people to come and and be be educated here. And it's also works more broadly across the. NHS and across the the sort of policies that have been put against migrants who work for for the NHS and for international students that want to come and and study um, nursing medicine and to not bring their dependents etc. We need to continually push against these things and we want to push and say that we want a world where. Uh, it might be cheesy, but we want a world based on care, on compassion, and where we can have um, education and health as, as the pillars of these two things. Thank you. All the highlighting, I mean, the thing is, local training is really, really important rather than colonial education that they'll get from us. So <laughs> I hear what you're saying. But it's about saying this is ridiculous. Uh, you know, people there will not, will not have, the next generation will not have the skills that they need. Thank you, though. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Victoria. When it come, comes to the UK at yeah, the University and College Union, and you, Victoria, are, of course, also closely in, involved in trade union activities, has called for a day of action on the 7th of February. And, on campuses across the UK, there will be protests. So at the University of Nottingham, we will have a protest from 1 to 2 p.m. on University Park. I'm sure in other locations uh, across the UK, there will be protests. And I think there's a good opportunity where we can demand that Palestinian students are indeed treated similarly to Ukrainian students and are afforded the same kind of scholarships and the same kind of support. Yeah, and it's it's gobsmacking that there has been such a difference in treatment. Perhaps we shouldn't be surprised, but it is certainly something we can point out. Definitely. Any, any more questions, contributions? Can I uh, uh, mention a couple of things, please? Dimitri first and then Alex. Okay. Um, I, I was, I'm Palestinian, I'm actually Victoria's father for my sins, <laughs> and uh, I'm proud to be her father. Uh, uh, cultural uh, 
uh, heritage stealing and the uh, edgeocide. It didn't start, uh, you know, with the war on Gaza or the Second Intifada or 1967. It actually started in 1948 at, at the Nakba and the uh, establishment of the State of Israel, and even before that, uh, during the British Mandate on Palestine. And um, uh, at the formation of uh, the State of Israel, the, uh, they actually, the Israelis or Zionists have, act, have stole most of the Palestinian archives. And it's not, uh, not many people know that uh, all the historic archives in Palestine, the largest collection is available in the Hebrew University or and, and many other archives are available in, the, in some Israeli institutions. And these historic archives, which is the treasure of Palestine for, for thousands, hundreds and thousands of years, have uh, been either uh, destroyed or falsified or hidden from uh, uh, people, uh, for most scholars or anybody. So you have very, very limited access to these. And um, so so basically our heritage has actually, and all is hidden in the, in the in the uh, hands of our enemy and uh, we must uh, try and recover these uh, one you know one day because these is very rich heritage and very rich important for the education not just for palestinians for the world as uh, you know as large because uh, palestine is where the basically the is the, the is the whole, it's called the holy land and that's where the three uh, religions have started, so th there is a religious aspect to that as well, and uh, so th that's very important. And uh, the second thing, in terms of modern day sort of cultural, uh, you know, sort of stealing and heritage, I mean, look at falafel or hummus or even majdul dates. It even this is all being claimed as is, is stolen as Israel as Israeli, uh, you know, food. But in fact, I mean, we. We've been eating these before anybody dreamt of the state of Israel. So now they all, you know, they've even stolen that in the supermarket. It is unmarketed as Israeli food. And our symbol, which is the Palestinian kofiya, which is already now become a symbol of struggle worldwide and demonstrations. And uh, they even now having a, an Israeli kofiya with blue colors. So they're even there this and our dubke, which is the traditional Palestinian dance, is that uh, they they making Israeli versions of it and they'll be exporting it throughout the world. So this is part of the you know the, uh, of of the burying of the Palestinian heritage and cultural heritage and claiming it to be sort of Israeli or uh, you know Zionist heritage. Uh, moving on to Gaza, obviously uh, twofold. Uh, we, I mean, the headline figure as it stands now, there's over 27,000 people have killed, have uh, been killed, and uh, almost uh, uh, more than half of them are uh, uh, children and women. But the other headline figure is almost 70,000 people who have been who have been injured, and these people who have in, been injured have lots of them are amputees or disabled. So the, these are. The, these will be, you know, the war will end sooner or later, but these will be a, basically a burden on the Palestinian society for all their life, because it probably take three persons to look after one, you know, one disabled person and the amount of, you know, the contribution to the society. And that's a deliberate policy from the Israelis' uh, occupation forces it's not just killing, it's actually disabling. It, it, it started at the Intifada before, where they used to break uh, you know, uh, legs and uh, uh, make people, uh, hurt people. So they they not just kill them because it's, uh, uh, it, it's part of their deliberate policy to affect how people, uh, you know, the, the long-term effect on the Palestinian society. And uh, so there is not, because you, you need rehabilitation for all these people, and there is no such facilities. Or the, what's the little facilities which are available in Gaza has already been destroyed. And uh, in terms of uh, one final point, in terms of uh, education, the Palestinians we are probably one of the most educated uh, uh, nation on earth because 
we are proud because what's left for us, people will starve themselves so they can spend on their education of their children. You know, you will probably have the highest uh, uh, per capita people with PhDs or higher degrees than any other nation because we understand that education is the way forward. And look, education is a way of teaching you know, our children and preserving our heritage and improving ourselves and liberating our country. And that's why it is a major attack has been on the education system because uh, they know that's what's left for us because you, you know you can destroy you, you know your house, you can destroy your school, but they cannot destroy what's in your mind, what's, what's the knowledge and knowledge is power. And that's why we need to uh, you know unite with that. Because I remember like uh, in 1948, uh, you know, at, at the at the day of the Nakba, there were at that time there were 750,000 Palestinian refugees, and then they came and they were living in refugee camps in around the towns of the West Bank. And my mom, mom who was just a just a, like a new graduate, she you know, and few other. Uh, ladies started educating the Palestinian uh, refugees in tents. And this is what's going to happen now in Gaza because they look, whatever happened, the people will not stop being learning, whether it's under you know, uh, de destroyed buildings or in tents. They will carry on with education, even by local educators or people coming from outside, because that's our way of life. Whatever they do, whatever they destroy, they're never going to uh, destroy our uh, thirst for knowledge and and self determination and strength and the importance of education to us. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Much appreciated, Victoria. I take first Alex, and then I let you respond to both. Yeah, Alex, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Victoria. It was um, yeah, a really kind of. Um, eye-opening and kind of comprehensive um, kind of talk that you gave. Um, so um, I work for a UK university and um, we are a, a university of sanctuary. So there's like a strong um, sanctuary university movement in the UK. Um, but that movement, while it, while it was very kind of quick to mobilize when it came to UK, um, Ukraine and uh, Afghanistan, it's been um, strangely silent um, during the, the events of the last few months. Um, and so that's something that, that I'd like to kind of to campaign and do something about, because I think that's a, there's a really strong kind of infrastructure there of universities of sanctuary. And I believe that there's people there who would really like to be kind of doing something. But I think I think people are scared, you know, people are, are kind of worried about you know in the current climate of you know how to go about this and they feel like universities are not necessarily being very open to um to this sort of discussion um so yeah i was just i was just wondering you know what you thought about this like what in, in which ways can the uk education sector the higher education sector most usefully kind of get involved like Things that I'm thinking of are uh, things like perhaps twinning initiative, like twinning with certain universities, maybe universities in the West Bank um, and things like that. And then kind of um, perhaps, you know, set, like you like you suggested before, like setting up scholarships, perhaps perhaps there could be, um, you know, some students from those twinned universities coming over to um, to their partners in the UK. But I was thinking also more widely because you mentioned about um you know the the documents ar archives and that sort of thing like um they they're not being a um a, a way to kind of electronically um keep that information safe like is there is there some potential there for uk universities to try and kind of save kind of capture some of those archives to kind of to keep them safe um and another thing that has sprung to mind is um distance learning you know cuz um some UK universities have started offering um, distance learning sanctuary scholarships for undergraduate and uh, master's level study. And I'm just wondering whether that might be a good thing for us to be able to offer to um, to people in um, in different parts of Palestine. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Victoria. 
Um, thank you both for your uh, contributions and yeah, I I, I do um, uh, appreciate um, what my father said and, and that's the way that all of all of us have been have been brought up and we will we will persist and we will continue to educate ourselves and what i think is even more powerful is that we're teaching the world how to resist how to be resilient how to keep educating yourself how to also use um knowledge as power whatever your situation even in the most horrific of times the p power comes um from within us and from our own our own um our own minds and our own engagement with with each other and i think that we've inspired the world with 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 our resilience and we're building um the mass social movement has emerged which around palestine which also challenges the way in in which we produce um education in in the west because palestinian knowledge is based on love it's based on love for your community it's based on love for your people so i think um there is always there is always hope in 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 that with regards to what universities can can do to save our archives they need to stop first of all they need to stop bombing them <laughs> and destroying them um through their um ties with the military industrial complex and their partnerships with Israeli institutions that that have theft and do steal, um, and associations like the Israeli Archaeological Association. So, sort of the the number one point of of really university action needs to be demilitarization, defunding, boycott um and divestment and and, and 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 sanctions and actually we're getting to the stage now that if universities do not do this they are going to be complicit and they are going to be in court on on complicity in, in genocide so they need to start seriously thinking about those things and it's no point doing the other stuff if they're going to continue with um, their role in the military industrial complex. Um, it's a difficult fight to have sometimes within the trade union movement because of the nature of, of the fragility of university funds and how our universities have become neoliberal in, in, in businesses effectively. Um, so it's where it's come to the point, really, and it's it's for fossil fuels as well, where we have to a decision has to be made, and and we as as scholars, I think that we need to push for saying that you know we 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 do not stand for this, we do not want this, we want to fight for our universities as a place of um, peace a place of coexistence, a place of progression, uh, and, and a place where um, n knowledge is produced on equal terms without destruction and to ensure, of course, jobs and the continuation of, of things like those the subjects that pursue those aims, like um, my own subject, peace studies. Um, I think, obviously, that's a really difficult fight 
to win but I think unless we we do it on those terms we we ourselves become become complicit in in um not just the destruction of Palestine but uh, of, 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 of other places and other peoples um I think with regards to um the sanctuary of scholarship etc cetera, etc cetera, I think we have to recognize and I think it's time a lot of refugee organizations anti-racist organizations recognize anti-Palestinian racism and recognize that it's not a threat to their funding not a threat to their um organizing that it's not that it's not a threat to um, their partnerships with other communities, and I think we have we have to, we have to really fight on that and can keep saying you know anti-Palestinian racism is 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 a huge thing, and it is there is a sort of collective silencing in which the NGO sector is very much in, involved with, and stop margin just stop marginalizing us to have discussions about anti-palestinian racism i do know i do know i think that the um university of sanctuary aren't taking um they're, they're not taking any new new applications i think for a while but i also think that we don't we shouldn't need a charter to say that our universities are a place of sanctuary they should be that it's not a university unless it is a place of sanctuary <laughs> and i think we you know we really need to keep insisting on on those broader arguments with 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 management and um in in terms of like these distance learning initiatives etc I mean, just anything that we can get is better than nothing. But I think we still need to um, not not have that at the the sacrifice of Palestinian of the Palestinian cultural genocide. So it's like you you we can have those scholarships, but not on the terms of the occupier and on the terms of the um, of the occupiers' narratives, and they need they need to be based around the concept of Palestinian self self determination and, and respect Palestinian ways of, of knowing through a real decoloniality. Um, optimistic, <laughs> but. That's, that's a good point, Victoria, because sometimes people would point out, okay, we call for scholarships for Palestinians, and I think that's a good call to make. But very often, these kind of scholarships are also being used to educate people from the global south in the way of how the West or the North, the global North is thinking. And uh, perhaps that needs to be combined also with actually appreciating the knowledge creation which comes from the people from the global south rather than us thinking we are educating the global south yeah and so that, that's a tricky yeah. ambivalent kind of strategy sometimes i can guarantee that most kids in gaza can have a much more intellectual discussion about global politics than a lot of our colleagues <laughs> we are coming up uh, to 25 past uh, 7 o'clock there's still time for perhaps one final question is there anything somebody would like to raise at this point in time any final thoughts or if not perhaps I give for a final time uh, the word to you Victoria for your final statement um, so I'm just going to use this uh, to plug, um, first of all, the new UCU network mm. that has been established on, which I'm I'm late for the meeting for, <laughs> it started at seven, but never mind, I'm sure they'll 
they'll forgive me, mm. which is um, to advocate for rights of Palestinians and to stop this genocide within universities and colleges. Um, I'll put my email in the chat if anyone is interested in getting involved in that, in, in that initiative. I would encourage you to support the um, look up your local uh, day, workplace day of action on mm. the 7th of uh, February. There should be an action in your university, etc. If not, it's not too late to organise mm. one. I'm sort of on the lot, uh, just sort of organising mine right now. Um, I would also like to say try and push for. Um, if you go to scholars uh, for Palestine dot org, there is a model motion that you can try and push in your student unions or in your um, education unions um, that calls for some of the uh, practical things that I've mentioned and um, keep up the pressure. Let's keep up, keep up the pressure, keep the movement going, keep getting the coaches down to London and um, keep up the local pressure as well and don't lose hope we we Palestinians we we ha we we have to hope we don't have a, a, a choice just keep come mm. on let's keep it up keep it up do not let this fizzle out we need to step up not start fizzling out thanks a lot Victoria that's a good note to end on thank you very much for this Brilliant presentation this evening. Thank you very much to all of you for attending and for raising these important issues in our discussion. We know what to do. The day of action is on the 7th of February. Check out your local university, what's going to happen there. As for CSSGJ seminars, check out our website, cssgj.org, and you can see our future and further seminar presentations. But for this evening, many thanks, Victoria. All the best. The struggle carries on, as always. Hasta la Victoria siempre. That is it. Thank you, Victoria. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs>